The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting-edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh, thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. The Pokagon Band of Potawatomi is expanding its tribal casino operations in Indiana to include Class Three gaming. While the tribal headquarters are located in Michigan, the tribe has land in nearby South Bend, Indiana, where its Four Winds Casino is located. Governor Eric Holcomb signed the historic 20-year compact with tribal leaders this week. The compact will allow table games such as blackjack and craps and also sports betting at Four Winds Casino. The U.S. Department of Interior still needs to review and approve the compact in the next 45 days. Also in Michigan, the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe is getting help to defend a historic site from vandals. The nation's Historic Preservation Office has been awarded a $63,000 tribal heritage grant from the National Park Service. The site is the former Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School. The school opened in 1893 and closed in 1934. It was part of the Federal Indian Boarding School program that removed Indian children from their families in an attempt to assimilate them. Today, two dormitories, some of the administration building, an old gymnasium, and a wood shop are all that's left from the school. The school is on the National Register of Historic Places and is owned by the tribe. The Saginaw Chippewa are now in the planning stages of renovating and repurposing the site. Voters in a Boston suburb want to keep the high school's Native American mascot and logo. The vote favors keeping the mascot despite the school committee's decision to discontinue using the warrior mascot. The mascot has an image of a man wearing a Plains-style feathered headdress. Stephen Peters is a citizen of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, which is 70 miles, 75 miles away from the school. And he says the vote shows they have a lot of work to do. You know, we look at it and say, okay, there was a close vote there, which tells me we've got a lot of work to do. Um, when, when we look at some of these mascots, specifically Wakefield, Massachusetts mascot, which is in my opinion, inappropriate for a number of reasons, not just the depiction of the Native American in a really menacing way, but also the fact that it is culturally inaccurate as well. You know, it really just perpetuates stereotypes that are, that are not correct, um, things that, that really hold Native Americans back. According to the Boston Herald, the vote was 55% in favor of keeping the mascot. Local Native American groups urge the town to retire the mascot, as other Massachusetts communities have done. According to the New England Anti-Mascot Coalition, 24 high schools there still use a Native American mascot. Well, you can now find the history and culture of Native Americans in California classrooms. The Pathmakers program was developed by the Blue Lake Rancheria Tribe and the Humboldt County's Office of Education. Lesson plans focus on science, technology, engineering, and math from a Native perspective, as well as traditional ecological knowledge. Native and non-Native students will also learn about the history, culture, and technologies of North Coast tribes. Pathmakers is partnering with tribal citizens who specialize in traditional customs and practices. Students will learn how to make traditional gill nets, as well as hunting tools. Plus, they will learn how to cook indigenous foods. Well, there is a need for more Native journalists in mainstream newsrooms across the country. So the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications is opening up its classrooms this summer to Native high school students. The two-week program will train high school students and give them hands-on experience in broadcast and digital journalism. They will learn everything from editing video, producing a newscast, and will be mentored by seasoned journalists. If you know a Native high school student who is interested in exploring a career in journalism, you can find more informa information on the website, cronkite.asu.edu. 
and search for Summer Journalism Institute. The deadline has been extended, and due to the pandemic, the program will be held virtually. And in full disclosure, Cronkite is a partner to Indian Country Today. Yupik artist and designer Peter Williams is bridging the worlds of fashion and art with cultural traditions in his latest exhibition. It's called Inherent Right and is on display at All My Relations Arts Gallery in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Williams is a culture bearer, artist, and fashion designer. He's based in Sitka, Alaska. Some of his hand-sewn works reuse self-harvested animal hides and turns them into wearable art. William says his artistic process continues the Alaska Native tradition of developing a personal relationship with the land and with animal relatives. His process includes hunting and fishing and tanning hides and hand sewing each piece. He says each stitch is a prayer. The exhibition is free and open to the public, and Williams will be giving a virtual artist talk next week on May 13th. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalahungva. When we come back, the Colville tribe celebrates a milestone. And we salute the mothers, sisters, aunts, daughters, and grandmothers. This is Indian Country Today. Earlier this week, Chairman Rodney Costin joined us to talk about wildfire season with the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. 50 years ago, on May 8, 1971, the Colville Tribes held a contentious election over tribal termination. I asked him to reminisce about that event. The tribe voted against termination, and it ended an era of failed government policy. One of the things that I remember was, you know, in my own family, my parents, it, it just even between them, it was such a huge argument. I remember hearing them argue about it all the time. And I think that was the thing that really brought my attention to it as a child. And, you know, hearing their discussions back and forth of, you know, if we terminate, what would happen? If we don't terminate, what would happen? And, but to hear, you know, the argument to, to not terminate because, if we do terminate, we're gonna lose all of our reservation lands. We'll no longer have a home. Our children will no longer have the hunting and the fishing and gathering that we are enjoying here today. And, you know, there'll be no more revenue or anything, you know, opportunities for us as a tribe or a tribal government to address the needs of our people. And that all of our lands would be sold and people would probably yeah. move in very quickly, you know, and as well as other operations or governmental operations. And I used to think about that as a child. I thought, well, if I can't go out hunting and if I can't go out fishing, you know, why would I want any amount of money? You know, I, that was at least, I remember that in my mind. And I thought, and then that would be forever, you know, for, and we even heard that, uh, you know, tribes who did terminate that their birth certificates were even changed from native or Indian to white. And I thought, well, how could you do that? It's just because you sold your lands or whatever. It doesn't change your ethnicity or who you are, you know, but that, you know, it's what we had heard, whether that was actually factual or not, I don't know. But uh, I just, to me, in as young as I was, I thought I was really so happy that, you know, it was voted down because I could not imagine um, us and, you know, for what we had left to even lose that. We've lost so much as Indian people. And I remember some of our tribal leaders at the time, you know, really pushing for self-determination or public law 93-638, and which just completely changed everything with the federal government and how the federal government interacted and worked with tribes, um, where tribes could then enter into contracts to have greater autonomy over managing their own programs. Um, you know, too, and I could see the other side of it though, too, because our lands, our people, you know, their lands were being sold from underneath them. You know, our reservation, you know, we are rich in natural resources here. And so, um, you know, everything was being extracted off our reservation, you know, uh, especially the timber and which is really damaging the water and the forest itself. And, you know, when you live here, it was just very evident when you see that happening. And, you know, our tribe didn't have a lot of control over manage, managing its own resources. And then the dams were built, you know, that stopped um, fish from coming up the Columbia River. And I remember a lot of our people talking about that, you know, how devastating that was for us as a people, because 
you know, we were of a salmon culture, you know, and one of the largest fishing sites in the Northwest was at Kettle Falls, which is right near our reservation. And to have just all of that taken away from us by the federal government without any consideration of us as Indian people, you know, that, um, that took away our culture, our religious systems, or, you know, a lot of our um, ceremonial events and, you know, just even the uh, uh, community events that would happen here all around that fishing season, especially at Kettle Falls. And um, to not have those places anymore. And I used to hear our, our elders talk about, you know, how our people gathered at what they called the Ceremony of Tears, which was the last time the fish came up to Columbia. And they knew that life was going to change for them forever. And so, you know, this was still fairly recent to all of those who are still, the people who are still alive back then. And they just couldn't see where the, the federal government was making decisions in the best interest of our tribe or, or of our people. And many of them wanted to remove that, you know, federal domination. And uh, I can see that point very well as well. So, uh, but it's really, so I feel good that, you know, at that point in time, it did change everything. And it changed everything on this reservation, you know, that we fought such a long battle because they wanted our land so desperately, you know, because like I said, there, there's a lot of precious metals and semi-precious metals here as well that they wanted. Um, and, you know, our people voted down mining time and time again as well. And, uh, uh, you know, so it, was, it feels good to me that it was stopped on this reservation. Our people stopped it. And I was also told that it was really the young people whose vote who changed you know, the direction of that in the final vote that many of the young people who had never ever voted before actually came out and voted and voted it down as well. Thank you, Colville Chairman Rodney Costin. When we come back, honoring the women in our lives. This week, we bring awareness to missing and murdered indigenous women. Native women face murder rates more than 10 times the national average. More than 5,000 American Indian and Alaska Native women are missing. 55% of Native women have experienced domestic violence, all according to the U.S. Department of Justice. Joining us today is Mary Catherine Nagel. She's a partner at Pipestem and Nagel. She represents the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center and works on issues facing women. Mary Catherine has written and produced several plays relating to Indians and the law. There's been a lot of advocacy at the grassroots level for, for generations on this issue. And of course, you know, we all know this violence against Native women began with the colonial conquest of our nations and violence against our women was a very strategic tactic used to conquer our nations. And unfortunately, that's, you know, um, because that violence has never been directly addressed, we're still dealing with it today. Today, we have had progress, you know, folks are probably familiar with laws like Savannah's Act, Not Invisible Act, and those are those are wonderful achievements and those are achievements made possible through the advocacy of our tribal leaders, victims, families, victims, advocates, Native women, uh, spokeswomen out there who, you know, have been fighting for this issue. I think What's important to remember is that those laws specifically that I just mentioned that were signed into law last October do not restore the criminal jurisdiction that the Supreme Court erased in Oliphant, which severely limits the ability of tribal nations to arrest and criminally prosecute uh, homicides committed against tribal citizens, Native women on tribal lands if they're committed by a non-Indian, which many of them are and also does not provide funding for tribal law enforcement, tribal courts, victim services, tribal governmental institutions. And that's another issue that we face in Indian country is lack of resources. Um, it's also an issue uh, that we're hearing from many federal law enforcement agencies as well, uh, who claim that they cannot investigate these cases because they simply do not have the law enforcement personnel on ground. So I think moving forward, one thing that we're really advocating for is first and foremost, just Restore, restoration of tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction, um, full stop, so that our tribal nations can fully protect anyone living within their borders, as is their inherent sovereign right to do so. 
And we're also looking for greater funding, but also too, at the end of the day, collaboration and dedication. You know, I think that the FBI, United States Attorney's Offices, I think they have a federal trust duty and responsibility from the hundreds and hundreds of treaties they signed with our tribal nations to investigate and prosecute these cases. And right now there's a lot of discretion um, and right now, the folks that are currently in position so far have not, for the most part, prioritized these cases. And so even though in many instances, the victims' families know very well or, or have a short list of suspects um, who, as to who murdered their daughter or their niece or their loved one, those cases are not being adequately investigated if investigated at all. Oftentimes too, they're being written off by federal authorities as a, um, a suicide or an accident or natural causes uh, when that's not the case. And so it's gonna take a lot of work. Uh, Savannah's Act again and not this black are steps in the right direction, but I think that's where uh, those of us who are advocates in the field are, are we're focusing right now. The Justice Department does have some discretion to provide more funding to tribal law enforcement. Uh, and tribal governmental institutions to deal with this crisis. But at the end of the day, the most helpful and direct way to get it done would be to have Congress to authorize this kind of appropriation. Unfortunately, those of us, I know NIWRC, my client, SBI, Sovereign Bodies Institute, National Congress of American Indian, and others who are advocating for the passage of Savannah's Act, specifically asked for Savannah's Act to include funding for tribal law enforcement, tribal victim services. And we were told that that was not politically possible at the time, that the bill would not pass if a funding was attached to it. So um, I know we're also working on the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, which um, the version HR 1620 out of the House if passed, uh, would increase in some ways tribal uh, funding for these efforts because we also understand that you know we're suffering from an epidemic of domestic violence and sexual assault against our native people and in particular our native women on tribal lands. And unfortunately, there is a reality that the more domestic violence is allowed to continue without consequence, the closer you get to a homicide. Oftentimes, domestic violence is a crime that escalates in nature. So if there's not an intervention when when it's sort of um, I don't want to say just hitting because hitting is horrible or other forms of domestic violence in terms of emotional, um, psychological, financial manipulation. But if you don't have an intervention early on, it often does escalate. And so a lot of Native women and um, two-spirit and Native person victims of um of homicide in Indian country were before, before the homicide victims of domestic violence that just went unprosecuted. So VAWA will, if passed, and we're working on a bipartisan VAWA in the Senate right now, if passed, would have a huge impact on it, addressing this crisis of murdered and mis missing indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit relatives. And I can't tell you how many times I've directly worked with victims' families where um, everyone in, in the community knows that the individual who murdered the Native woman or girl that, that whose family I'm representing was a former lover, current spouse, ex-boyfriend. Um, these are, these are you know, that we can have stranger homicide and it does happen. And we certainly have issues of sex trafficking and human trafficking where our Native women and girls are picked up off the streets. But um, we, we have a, such a high rate of intimate partner violence that um, restoring tribal criminal jurisdiction over those crimes in, on tribal lands will have a huge impact on this crisis. Thank you, Mary Catherine Nagel. It's Mother's Day, and we'd like to congratulate the Foster Mother of the Year, Sherry Pena. She's Cherokee and has always wanted a large family. Welcome, Sherry. Tell me about your foster children. We've had 13 children in our home. Uh, we had a set of three at first. Um, their ages were four, three, and eight months. Um, they, that was an experience. The first day that they were there, they clogged three toilets. Uh, they had flushed uh, rubber duckies down the toilet. Um, and then we had, we had those children for 18 months. Uh, so they're a big part of our family, even still today. We had a set of five. And in fact, we had the three with us still when the five came in and their ages was from eight to five weeks. And the five week old baby was very sick at the time and had to have surgery. 
Um, but if you saw him today, he's, he's doing great. He's, uh, climbs all over me, kisses me. Um, he's just a joy. Uh, but those five are, um, transitioned to a family back in Arizona and doing great. Um, right now I'm fostering two babies. Uh, they are two weeks apart. They're nine months, going on 10 months, um, a boy and a girl. Uh, we're getting ready to adopt our little boy uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks. And our little girl, uh, her mom is doing amazing and I have a great relationship with her. She, uh, she calls me mom. And um, I've got a great relationship also with the grandmother of this beautiful little girl. What advice do you have for those who are interested in foster care? You're not just dealing with the children, and I wouldn't say dealing, but loving them and, and caring for them, but their families. I, I love their bio families. They're, they are amazing people who struggle. We all struggle but it's fun to watch them grow and learn how to be parents again. And um, that's my favorite part is working with the parents too. I try to talk to the family and ask, you know, a diff, you know, what they do um, within their culture. Uh, a baby's first laugh, you know, you're, you have a big celebration. Um, I rely on books and like I said, and I've reached out to my friends who have different tribes and asked them, you know, what should we be doing with um, the children? And, uh, and it's fun too, because the older kids that have come into my home have taught me different things about their tribe. And we apply them in our lives while they're here. And even after they're gone, we still keep up those traditions. The joy is watching families come back together stronger. Um, I get a little emotional with that because it's what it's about is putting families back together. And I love, I love all those kids that have come into my home, but not just them, but their families and extended families. It's it's such a joy and to watch my kids love their families too is amazing. It's, it's all about families. Foster Mother of the Year, Sherry Pena. The ICT team wishes all a happy Mother's Day. Take a look.
Thank you, Quindrea Yazi and Max Montour, for that shout out to our mothers. From all of us in the newsroom, thanks for joining us. Stay safe and have a great weekend. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. Indian Country Today is produced at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. This is Indian Country Today.